Well, good morning, everyone. I am Mark Cowan. I am the grant program coordinator for the local government grant program. Thank you for joining us today. Also with me today is Jody Delphi, the coordinator for the recreational trails program, and also Michelle Scalise, our grant section manager. Jody and Michelle are going to be kind of monitoring the question and answer box. And uh, when questions come through and you ask questions, if it's something that they feel they can just shoot a quick answer to you, they probably will. Uh, but if it's something that can benefit the entire group, they will just interject the question into their, our discussion today so that we can all hear the, the question and the answer for, the, for everyone's benefit. Uh, this webinar will be recorded. We should have it posted within a few days afterwards on our local government grant program website. So you can refer back to it at any point if you'd like to. Uh, we usually try to post the actual webinar and then actually just the uh, um, a PDF version of the PDF or the PowerPoint as well, so that you can refer back to the, the presentation uh, just briefly if you'd like to as well. Today, we're gonna to be talking, uh, just we're gonna to touch on the history of the program, the funding that we have available, who's eligible to apply, the types of projects we deal with. We'll discuss our scoring criteria, and we'll go through the, the list of required documents that is required for the application. And then we'll discuss the online application process briefly. And then we'll touch on the presentation and, and the timeline. And then of course, we'll be happy to answer questions as we go along. This is just a quick little pictorial showing you the, the footprint and the impact that the local government grant program has had throughout the state over the last 20 years. We, this year, we just crossed the threshold of a million, uh, $100 million in local government grant program awards going out to communities throughout our state. Pretty big milestone. This all started back in 1998 when voters passed ballot measure 66, the Oregon Lottery Revenues for Parks and Conservation. That dedicated 7.5% of the state lottery proceeds to the Oregon Parks and Recreation Department, which is a wonderful thing for state parks, give, give it a uh, stable source of funding. What that did is it dedicated 12% of OPRD's share to the local government grant program. The way legislation was written, it said if state lottery proceeds to OPRD exceed 150% of the funds transferred in the 2009-11 biennium, then that percentage changes from 12% to 25% of OPRD's share going to the local government grant program. As you can see, that's slightly more than double the funding. And that trigger just happened in this uh, just previously. So just kind of taking a look back where we've been. In the 2020 cycle, you'll remember that was the beginning of the pandemic. We weren't sure what lottery funds were going to do. So we picked a $5 million number thinking that's, amount, that's an amount that we can adequately cover with funds on hand if necessary, if lottery funds should dry up. And then they kind of did. And then in the 2021 cycle, you remember, we didn't even offer a grant cycle because we weren't sure what lottery funds were going to do. And then uh, things began to start opening up and the lottery started to rebound. And so in the 22 year, we opened the cycle back up again with, uh, lo and behold, a pent up demand of applications plus pent up funding. The lottery rebounded. We had uh, twice as much funding to work with. We kind of did two years and one that year. It was a real gangbuster year. And then in 23, things began to settle down a little bit with a more normal influx of applications. However, the funding, we started to feel the effects of this trigger. We had a few months worth of what we refer to as the trigger, uh, tipping more money into the local government grant program. Since then, we have hit that trigger, and then we have had to actually reach back a few months into the previous cycle, pull money forward once that trigger was hit. Plus, lottery funding has just simply increased, and what that means is it in this 2024 cycle, we have $34 million to work with. So in this grant cycle, we have 300,000 earmarked for small community planning grants, 5 million for the small grant category, and 28 million for the large grant category for a total of 34 million. So what have we done to kind of adapt to this? And we have raised the grant thresholds on each of our different categories. So in the small community planning grants, we raised the maximum grant award from 40,000 to 50,000. And in the past cycle, the average award really was 40,000. That's very typical for small community planning grants. And of course that uh, average is most likely going to go up in this cycle. In the small community planning, or excuse me, the small grant category, we raised the maximum request from 75,000 to 100,000. 
In the past cycle, the average award was 63,000. And of course that's going to go up with this higher threshold. In the large grant category, we raised the maximum request amount from 750,000 to a million. In the last cycle, the average award was 420,000. And of course that, is, uh, that average award is gonna go up in this cycle as well. Acquisition grants remain with a maximum request of $1 million. Typical range on acquisitions is anywhere from 500,000 to a million. And we typically receive one to two acquisition requests in any given cycle. So one thing I wanna stress right off the bat, that this is a reimbursement grant process, meaning that you spend your money and then you apply to us for reimbursement. So you would initially pay for your project expenses and then you would submit a request to us. And with that request, you would submit full documentation of your payments and your, your expenses, submit the request to us, and then say, if this is a 50-50 grant situation, we would pay you back 50 cents on the dollar. So it's important that you have cash flow within your own agency to at least get the project started. It's up to you whether you submit your um, reimbursement request in one, one big reimbursement request at the end of your project, or if you want to do quarterly reimbursement requests to kind of keep the cash flow going, spend some money, get reimbursed, spend some more money, get reimbursed. That's entirely up to you, whatever works best for your agency. Eligible applicants to the program are cities, counties, parks and recreation districts, port districts, and metro. Now, if you're in the audience today and you're not employed with one of these agencies, you can certainly get involved in this process, but you have to be coming alongside, say, your city or your county parks district and working with them. These, the application has to come from one of these eligible entities, and one of these eligible entities has to be the financial responsible party to the application. There is uh, matching grant re match requirements from the applicant. There's a 50% match required for our larger cities and districts with population greater than 25,000 and counties with a population greater than 50,000. There's a 40% match required for our medium range cities and districts, population between 5,000 and 25,000 and counties with a population between 30 and 50,000. And then for our smaller communities, there's a 20% match required for cities and districts with a population under 5,000 and counties with a population under 30,000. Now I will add a little caveat here that if you're a parks and recreation district, when you apply, you do need to be able to identify what the population of your service district is. Sometimes parks and rec districts are smaller than the community that they're in. Sometimes they're much, much larger, like in the Eastern side of the state, they can encompass more than just a community. So when you're submitting your application, be aware of, if you are a parks and rec district, be aware of what your population is and be careful that you're uh, positioning yourself in the right category here. Eligible match can include budgeted funds, of course, from your, your agency budget. That's the easiest and the most common. You can also use uh, your agency labor and equipment as part of your match to your project. If you have any materials or supplies on hand, that's uh, fair game as well. You can match federal dollars with local government grant program funds. Of course, any other eligible grants and private donations are all uh, good too. You can actually use the value of land as match towards a project as well. If you have land that you've acquired with the intent of expanding your park, uh, your park properties, any land that you've acquired within the last six years and is supported by an appraisal, you can use that land as match. Also, any kind of pre-agreement planning costs that you have, if you have land and you've done some surveying work on it or some preliminary planning, any of those costs that you've occurred within two years of the application time, that can be used, but uh, you cannot exceed 15% of the total cost of your total project. So say for instance, you're applying for a $100,000 project overall, 15% of that or $15,000 could come from pre-agreement planning costs that could be actually added to the budget and identified as pre-agreement planning costs. Volunteer labor, when it comes to using volunteer labor as match in your application, there's two ways to document or ascertain what the value of that is. 
Uh, first way is the bully rates. And if you're using skilled laborers within your project, say you've you know, got heavy equipment operators or, or masons, that sort of thing, those would be skilled laborers and they're gonna be at a much higher rate than just a general volunteer. So we, it makes sense to use the bully rates for determining the value of their time. However, if you have like a group of 20 high school kids that come out and do some invasive species removal on a stream bed or something, that would be considered just general volunteer. We refer to the independent sector. They establish the value of an independent, um, the value of an independent hour every year uh, within the within the country. They do it state by state. They're usually like one year behind, which that makes sense. So the most recent information we have is for the 2022 year, and volunteer labor in Oregon at that point was uh, determined to be $32.37. So that's a, an hourly rate that you could use for volunteer labor. So. The one thing is though, we ask that you use one method or the other, not mix the two. And also when using volunteer labor in your application, it's very important that you keep very detailed timesheets, say you know who worked and when, how many hours, what date, and then that needs to be signed off by a, a city or a county or a park district official. Any kind of materials you have on hand are fair game. You can use donated materials as well. You just need to, you know, when you determine the value of those, it just needs to be a, you know, a current fair market value and a reasonable value. Any kind of equipment donations, you might be in a situation where you've got a contractor in town that says, hey, we'd love to help you with this park, we'll donate our time. And that's all great. And you can document the use of their equipment or their value basically using, you know, a fair market rental rate and that sort of thing. Okay, what types of projects do we get involved with? The, the categories that the local government grant program stipulates are acquisitions, development, acquisition and development, rehabilitation, and small community planning grants. And of course, this is all for outdoor park and recreation areas that are open to the public. Acquisition projects can include the acquisition of land and water bodies for public recreation, uh, the most obvious would be for just new park properties, but you can add to existing parks. Trail networks are also eligible and just open space for conservation. Anytime you're dealing with an acquisition, we always have to establish value with an appraisal. If you are dealing with an acquisition that you think is going to basically just have your own uh, agency money in and local government grant program money, uh, usually a uniform standards of professional appraisal practices appraisal is appropriate and, and all that's necessary. However, if you ever believe there's you want to include federal grants or federal dollars in this project now or in the near future, we, you would need to jump up to the uniform appraisal standards for federal land acquisitions, often referred to as a yellow book appraisal. It's a little more detailed. So if there's any federal dollars involved, go to the yellow book appraisal. If you don't anticipate having any federal dollars, involved, you can have just the standard commercial grade appraisal. Once you have an appraisal initiated, then the next step would be to have it reviewed by a qualified appraisal reviewer. This is often referred to as a desk appraisal. And think of this as like a check and balance. You have appraiser number one does the main, the main appraisal, and then you pass that appraisal off to a, a, a second appraiser who does a desk review. And basically what they do is they go through and they say, yes, we agree with their comps, we agree with their methodology, and we concur with their conclusion of the dollar value. It's just sort of a, a check and balance type situation. Initiating both the appraisal and the appraisal review is the responsibility of you, the applicant. These, the appraisal and the appraisal review need to be submitted with the application, and those appraisal costs can be included as part of your match. Now, if you've you got a very small piece of property and the valuation is very likely under 25,000, you can ask us for a waiver valuation. We'll give you permission to go ahead with that. And basically what that is, is you can you can uh, contact a, an established realtor in your area, have them run some comps on similar property within your area, have them write a brief letter of opinion saying, look, we this is what the property is like. It's it's 0.3 acres and we've got comps on similar properties. This, is, this property is valued at 22,000 and we'll accept that. We would rather do that than have you, you know, have to go through the whole hoops of a full appraisal for a very small dollar amount piece of property. 
Another situation that might arise with an acquisition is their property might come on the market in your area and say, wow, that, we've had our eye on that for a long time for park purposes. But you know, there might be a couple of other entities that think that's gonna be a great place for apartment houses. So if you think that this is a piece of property that you need to jump on now and buy while the opportunity is good, what you can do is shoot us a letter and say, we would like to apply for a waiver of retroactivity and we'll ask you for some brief documentation. And then if everything looks good, we will send you back an approval saying, go ahead, you can buy that property now. And then this waiver allows you to apply to the local government grant program within the very next cycle for hopefully acquisition help. So this is um, a vehicle that's available to you out there if this should come up in your area. When you do this acquisition project, if there's any kind of structures on the property, we're gonna to wanna to kind of know what those are and what the intended use is. Do they fit in, in outdoor recreation at all or are they going to be uh, demolished and the property reclaimed? Um, if you're applying for an acquisition for delayed development, it's gonna be a while before you have the opportunity to do any development on the property. We That property ideally should be open to the public in some form of recreation. Maybe it's just trail use or open space, whatever. We would like to see development take place within a two year period. Moving on to development projects. When we think of development, we think of creating something new. Uh, a lot of times people always, they're always, the question we often get asked is how do I differentiate between development and rehabilitation? Well, think of development as something new, rehabilitation is bringing something older back up to usable life. So we're talking about new projects right now. <clears throat> These would be new projects that would be hopefully uh, a project that would be lined up with the SCORP, the State Comprehensive Outdoor Recreation Plan, or some sort of comprehensive plan from your community or a parks master plan or just any kind of local planning effort, just from your, your, your parks, uh, Citizens Parks Board. And as you can imagine, you know, outdoor recreation facilities covers the gamut, anything outdoor recreation, play fields, playground equipment, picnic areas, trails, water trails, et cetera. These are all fair game for development projects. Now, along with that comes what we refer to as support facilities. This can be roads, parking areas, restroom buildings, picnic shelters, kiosks, walkways, landscaping. You know, typically, the local government grant program does not get involved in anything with four walls, no, no enclosed indoor facilities. However, the obvious exception to that is restroom buildings. We do a lot of restrooms. You know, every park needs, most parks need a restroom. Another uh, example would be a bathhouse connected to an outdoor swimming pool. Now, as I mentioned earlier, back to rehabilitation projects, this means the repair, the restoration, or reconstruction of existing facilities. It's usually, oftentimes, this has to do with um, uh, access requirements of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Your facilities don't meet the, the code right now and need to be upgraded for handicap accessibility. Or maybe it's beyond its ex uh, life expectancy, it's become obsolete. There might be uh, damage due to fire, natural disaster, vandalisms, doesn't meet health, health and safety codes or you might just simply have changing recreational needs in your community. One, one thing that we see a lot of right now is retrofitting a tennis court here and there for pickleball. That's kind of a big thing right now. Uh, with any rehabilitation project, we do like to see photos of what needs to be rehabilitated. We encourage photos with all of our applications, but particularly with rehabilitation projects, just because photos are so useful and, and can tell us so much and such a quick bit of information. And lastly, our small community recreation planning grants. We have 300,000 earmarked in this particular cycle. The maximum award is 50,000 per grant. This is for our uh, cities and districts with a population of less than 10,000 and counties with a population less than 50,000. And then we break it down uh, to two tiers. There's a 20% match required for cities or districts with a population less than 5,000, counties with a population less than 30,000. And then there's a 40% match required for cities or districts with a population between five and 10, and counties with a population between 30 and 50.
Eligible projects within the planning grant category are system-wide park and recreation plans. So if you have a small community and you have three parks within your town, you can encompass all three parks within that, uh, within that plan, or maybe just one park needs the attention. So it can be a site-specific recreation plan for that park. Also community or regional trail systems are another category for that. I will just take a little plug, put a little plug in here for the 1317 SCORP Appendix A. We have included this with the uh, with the application. It's one of the resources attached. Um, this is this this planning guide has a lot of great uh, information in it. So if you're embarking on a planning project, that uh, would be something I'd encourage you to take a look at. A lot of times when people think planning grants, they think, oh great, we can get our engineering uh, taken care of here. But that's really not the, the, the intent of the small community planning grant. This generally involves the planning, uh, utilizes specialized consultants to work with the local citizenry to help develop a, uh, a site specific or a recreation plan. And the planning project should include substantial public participation. And that's really the goal of this here is typically smaller communities don't have the wherewithal and the manpower to bring all these parties together to gather the information and then to put it all together into a plan. So the end goal here is to have a master plan that will guide future park or trail developments. Usually this includes a, a concept plan as well. Just to kind of go over quickly the uh, projects that would be ineligible, like I mentioned earlier, any indoor facilities, uh, community centers, indoor swimming pools, historic buildings, meeting rooms, maintenance buildings, these are all ineligible. Just like I mentioned earlier, the one thing that is eligible that's indoors would be restroom or a bathhouse connected to an outdoor swimming pool. Routine maintenance and repairs, typically not eligible. We kind of expect the agencies to take care of that on their own. Any facility that's dedicated just for professional facilities, or designed for semi-professional arts or athletics, that would not be eligible. Exhibit areas, not eligible. Exclusive use areas, so like you know, a ball field that would only be only uh, service a certain you know little league or whatever would not be eligible. Things need to be open to the public in general. Acquisition for historic sites, no. Where there's there's other funding available for historic and archaeological type situations. And then lastly, acquisition for land to help meet public school minimum size, site size needs. There's other, other dollars uh, at school districts for these types of things and the local government grant program doesn't get involved in this. One thing that is foundational for any application is that uh, the applicant has to have control or ownership of the site. So facilities may be developed on land and water that is owned outright, or you have a lease or an easement that provides control of the property for a minimum of 25 years. Okay, shifting gears a little bit, let's talk about the scoring criteria. You've heard us mention the SCORP, that's the Statewide Comprehensive Outdoor Recreation Plan. I'm guessing many of you have a, a bound volume on your, your desk right now or on your bookshelf. And if you, uh, if you don't, you can easily go to uh, any of our websites, either the local government grant program site or go through oprdgrants.org. They'll both get to the same place. Type in SCORP in the little search window here and it'll take you right to the state's SCORP site so that you can have easy access to that. The SCORP is also embedded in the application as a resource. So it's uh, readily available to you right in the application. This is the overall scoring criteria. You can see, uh, Categories one, two, and three are heavily SCORP influenced, 20 points, 10 points, and 25 points, followed by a collection of, in general, five point questions, uh, highlighting different aspects of uh, things that we, we like to promote within the application as a priority. All the way down to the very bottom where you see the discretionary committee criteria, committee members have 15 discretionary points that they can um, utilize as they see fit for a total of 120 points possible. So let's just talk through these a little bit. Um, number one, consistency with statewide priorities is a 20 point question. So does the project address any of the statewide priorities identified in the 2019-23 SCORP? And if so, what needs are addressed? Now it's very specific. It'll point you to tables 12.1 and 12.2, pages 2.16 of the SCORP itself. So this isn't a place to just uh, freelance your answer. These answers need to come from the tables in the SCORP. 
Table 12.1 is public recreation provider identified needs. So when the SCORP was created, recreation providers throughout the state, so state, you know, city and county and park district agency members responded to this portion of the survey to establish what they believe is needed within the state. Table 12.2 is Oregon resident identified needs, and these are just us citizens as recreators responding to the survey saying, this is what we think we need. So does your project meet any of the priorities in either of these tables? And it's gonna point you to these tables. And as you can see, the tables are, it's broken up into a quadrant here. We have close to home priorities on the left, dispersed area or rural area priorities on the right. And the top one is public Oregon provider survey results. And the bottom one is Oregon resident outdoor recreation survey results. So in the upper left corner right away, if your system, if your project is a community trail system, or if it's a restroom project, or if it's children's playground with play areas built with manufactured structures, those are, if your project includes that, that's what you'll want to say in your response. Simple as that. You don't need to go into a lot of detail. You certainly can expand, but this is really, you know, what we're looking for. Does your project involve any of these things? Yes, it involves a restroom. So that's kind of the way a lot of these questions are gonna work. Uh, question number two, consistency with statewide issues. Does the project address any of the following issues identified in the SCORP? It directs you to the tables, it gives you the page number, and then the issues are an aging population, an increasingly diverse population, families with children, or low income population. Does your project hit any of these areas? Now this gets a little interesting because then it's gonna point you to these tables where it says, okay, we've got a young old population, high priority county. Think, hmm, uh, either I am listed as one of these counties and if you are, you definitely wanna put that. And if you're not, you think, well, now, now what do I do? Well, am I in, a, in one of these, the next one down, table four, am I in a high priority UGB? If you are, great, if you're not, well, and then the bottom one, middle old population, again, it's naming off these counties again. My recommendation is if you're listed here, great, identify that, listed in the application. If you're not, I would just be upfront with that and say, no, we are not listed in a high priority area. However, our project will do this. So don't feel defeated by just seeing that you're not listed here. There's, you, you can still provide an answer. And then, um, then there's this bigger laundry list attached to consistency with statewide issues. Does your issue hit any of these targeted areas? And you can see there's the, the green font kind of segregates the categories here. And you can see kind of in the middle of this table, you've got urban areas, suburban, rural, and then outside of urban growth boundaries. So you kind of want to say, okay, I'm in, I'm in a kind of a suburban park situation. Will my, is my project providing more restrooms dirt or other soft surface trails, nature and wildlife viewing areas, et cetera. So this is where you're gonna kind of take your cues for your responses to these questions. Moving on to question three, local needs and benefits. Again, this is a biggie, 25 points. Needs identified through the public creation provider survey, Oregon resident survey, local planning documents, parks master plan, or public workshop or a public meeting. So they're, what they're asking is, does your project did it get its, its, its motivation and its impetus from one of these categories? And it doesn't have to hit all of them. And if it only hits one, that's fine. All of these are separately legitimate reasons in, uh, for your project. So you want to expand on, yes, we've, you know, it's say it's, um, you know, just, it's a very local project. It uh, came out of your local public meetings with your local parks. Look, we have got to get better playground equipment in our park. It may not be in a master plan, but at least you've got some sort of a meeting to back up the rationale for presenting this as a project. Bicycle and pedestrian trail projects have been given a little bit of uh, extra value here with five points. If your project includes any kind of um, trails or connecting trails to parks or trail systems connectivity between communities or an alternative transportation route. Those are all great things to list. Question number five, physical benefits. Again, is, we're going to refer you to these tables. Does your project include uh, any of these topics? And are you in one of these high priority counties? Again, if you're not listed in one of those counties, I'd say, look, we're not in this county. We're not in a high priority, but our trail, our project will do this. 
Major rehabilitation is highlighted with an extra five points. Does your project help bring uh, the site up to code for uh, ADA purposes? Is it beyond its useful life? It needs to be uh, refurbished. Is it, or does your project help bring this up to safety and uh, health codes or simply changing recreational needs? Those are the things you'll want to list. Community support. We invite you to uh, attach letters of support to your application. And we would encourage people to limit that to five. You know, we'll say that letters from actual users are usually considered the most interesting uh, by the advisory committee. Now, if you have a situation where you have, um, if you have 20 letters that are just heartwarming from an, uh, an elementary school class, yeah, you can, you can submit those. But what I would recommend is you scan all your letters of support letters together into one PDF and then upload them as one PDF so that they can all be opened with just one mouse click by our advisory committee. It just saves a lot of you know, effort on their part. They can just do one click, open all the letters of support and, and scroll through them that way. That'd really be helpful. If you've got any particular survey analysis for your from your community about this particular park or project or trail or whatever, you could this would be an opportunity to uh, to highlight that as well. Your financial commitment will be uh, demonstrated obviously through your resolution to apply for a grant. That's one of the things that has to be submitted. And we'll give you an opportunity to discuss uh, your, your funding and your match a little bit on question eight. We'll ask you to describe the accessibility accommodations. How is this project, uh, what is it doing to help with ADA accessibility? And then going one little step beyond that, this last question of universal design concepts, how does your project go beyond ADA and just make this whole project just very attractive and user-friendly to, to everyone across the board? That's kind of what we're looking for with that category. Lots of times when people think of sustainability, the first thing they think of is, well, you know, recycling or solar lights or whatever, and that's true but it can be considered broader than that. We can think of, is your project have any environmental sustainability characteristics to it or economic sustainability? Is uh, this project going to allow you to stop having to completely uh, rebuild the swimming pool pump every season with a new pump that will cut down on maintenance and save money? You know, that's economic su sustainability, basically. Community sustainability, does it bring cohesiveness to the community? Those are all fair game under that sustainability question. And then lastly, we're going to ask you to describe how your agency or your, this project or how it will help meet diversity, equity, and inclusion objectives within your community and agency. Resources to help you answer all these questions are, are embedded in the application. There's the online application instructions. There's the local government grant program manual that's embedded with the application as well. We purposely upload it as a Word document so that you can actually do a Word search if you're looking for particularly words like lease, um, control, uh, eligible, ineligible, 25 year, any of the kind of things that you're looking for, you can do a word search on the manual, it makes it really handy. The SCORP is included, the SCORP planning guide is included. And you can get to all these things online either by going to oprdgrants.org or through oregon.gov slash OPRD. Both of these places will get you to the same, to the same destination. Okay, now we're getting into the really good stuff. These are the list of required attachments that we will ask you to submit along with your application. Uh, if you have construction drawings or concept drawings, you'll wanna start off with that. There's an environmental checklist, and I will stress that this is a self-environmental checklist that you'll need to complete and submit. That's in, it's, uh, the form is in the application. You'll download it, complete it, upload it back up to the application. Same with the land use compatibility form. It's a form within the application. You download it, have it completed by your uh, local planning department and submitted with the application. We do like maps um, and kind of a variety of maps. Think of it as kind of going from the large, zooming down to, to the small. And then a 7.5 minute USGS topo map for SHPO purposes or a one square mile map with geographic fe uh, features that are identifiable or a KMZ file from Google Earth. These are all fair game to meet SHPO needs. We like to see photos of the site and we'll ask you to also complete a resolution to apply for a grant through your, your city council or board of directors. 
There's a couple of state agency review forms that we'll ask you to submit. And then if this is an acquisition, you will need to submit an appraisal and an appraisal review with the application, proof of a willing seller and a title report. And we'll discuss these in more detail. I've chosen to highlight particularly this park boundary map. That's one of the requirements. It's probably one of the more important maps that we'd ask you to submit. And this is an example of a really good one. And um, so as you can see, it's got the agency name at the top, a description of the project, then the map itself. And then there's a legend down in the bottom left corner identifying what the boundaries are. And then there's a scale and then a north arrow. And as you can see in this map, the park itself is, de is cl very closely outlined in yellow. And then the project is project site itself was within the park and highlighted with a different color. And then amenities within the park are labeled. This is a great park boundary map. If you can do this or come as close as you can, we'll be really happy. The environmental checklist, like I said, it is a form. It's a, it's a complete packet actually in the application. And um, you will download that, work through the, the environmental checklist itself, and then that part will be completed. And then we'd ask you to include with that a 7.5 minute topography map listing township range and section, or a Google Earth map that clearly shows roads or geographical features so they can be identified location-wise, or a KMZ file from uh, created out of Google Earth. And then there's going to be a blank state agency comment form. And what you'll do is you'll get the, complete this packet, include the maps, provide a brief description of the project um, in the cover memo, and you'll send this off to Department of State Lands, Department of Fish and Wildlife and Department of Environmental Quality. So DSL, ODF and W, and DEQ. Now you do not need to submit anything to the State Historic Preservation Office or SHPO. We will do that for you. If your project is selected for funding, we will forward your packet to SHPO for you. There are, however, a couple of forms in the, the application that we would like you to complete a couple of SHPO forms so that when we do submit it to SHPO, those forms are in our hands and ready to go. This is what the contact list looks like within that environmental contact uh, agency contact form. And as you can see here, there's uh, DSL at the top, then the second one down is ODF and W, and then DEQ is going to have four different offices. So you'll want to look to the right, the, the, the right column in blue font. Each of these columns describes which area DEQ has responsibility for. So you wanna send that to the right person. Now I will say that um, there, there's descriptions here in the, blue, in the blue instructions and particularly like with DSL, they say only submit projects with ground alteration. So if you have absolutely no ground disturbing activity, you do not need to submit to SHPO. Same thing with ODF and W, they say submit only if you've got ground disturbance. So, but to keep in mind, a four inch hole for a post hole, that's ground disturbance. So uh, when in doubt, submit. So you wanna submit um, your agency contact information to your state agencies as early as possible. They have 30 days to respond and they're very busy. So if they don't respond, that might be the same as we have no comment. Sometimes they just choose not to respond and that's their way of responding. We have no comment and they don't respond. So that just kind of may be the way that that plays out. There's a question in the application that also asks, does your agency have a completed ADA transition plan? If you do, great, you answer yes. If you do not, then we would ask that you do a self-assessment for existing facilities. And this is nothing complicated. We have some self-assessment tools embedded in the application. They're nice graphics that show um, dimensions and measurements for turning radiuses, sidewalk widths, uh, accesses to restrooms, those sort of things. They're just, they're very handy, easy to use. And we just ask that you do some sort of a self-assessment for your project so that we know that you've taken these things into consideration. Now, granted, if you're gonna have this engineered, then most likely, uh, those engineering plans will include all this self-assessment as well. You don't need to submit any kind of self-assessment results. We just need to know that you've gone through that, that exercise. The land use compatibility statement needs to be submitted to your local planning office. 
Uh, you need to include construction or concept plans, and, and then if, uh, you'll touch on any permits that might be required. And our admonition to you is if you're doing anything that's going to involve the Army Corps of Engineers, we just ask that you uh, get a, a, an early head start on that. Again, just kind of a recap on acquisition projects. If you have an appraisal that's been completed within the last 12 months, we'd like to see an appraisal that's fairly recent, if at all possible. Have you started that appraisal review process? Do you have proof of a willing seller? This can just simply be a, a brief letter or email from the seller. And do you have the potential to develop that property uh, within two years after the acquisition? Okay, now let's talk about the online grant application itself. Um, most of you, I'm guessing, have already kind of gone in and peeked at the uh, oprdgrants.org. I'm going to look around a little bit. You already have an account. If you don't, you'll go to oprdgrants.org. This will be the first screen that you'll see, and there's this underlined this link where the green arrow is pointing. Click on that. That will open up an account access request form. Complete the form. Submit it to us. We'll get you set up with an account within a day. Once you have an account, uh, and you come on to your city's or agency's screen, you'll see this big red button that says 11 new applications available. In any given grant cycle, we have new applications coming, becoming available. Now, keep in mind within the local government grant program, we have 11, you can see there, this says 11 applications, but five of them would be from the local government grant program. We have, you know, uh, planning, acquisition, development, rehabilitation, acquisition, and development. So, You'll click on that, and then this is the list of all the uh, applications that are available. So say, for instance, you're interested in a local government grant program development application, you click on that. And then when you click on your applications again, you will see where the green arrow is pointing. It'll be this just, just generic red title saying, this is your new application. You'll open that up, and once you give it a title, it'll appear just like these other applications here that already have a title. Once you get in the application, you can see these various um, different tabs or headings. You've got project information at the top, your contact information, and then the financial information. This is where you'd actually build your budget. The, uh, the numbers right in the middle of the page here, those will automatically populate when you add line items down below. And I've just built a, just a very brief sample example budget here. And as you can see, gravel, 20,000, CXT restroom building, 100,000, plumbing, 50,000, electrical, 20,000. There'll be a blue button here that says add line item. You click on that blue button and you'll be able to add each of these individual line items. And then every time that you do that, there's also a little box that appears that gives you an opportunity. It says, does any of this item include match? <clears throat> now in this last line where it says source of funding worksheet, I clicked that little button that says, is this match? And that's where you put in your city budget funds that you're going to contribute. So in this case, it's 50,000. So as you can see up above again, this is populated in that the, the requested amount, the grant request is 140,000. The match amount is 50,000. The total project cost is 190,000. And the grant right now sits at 73% and the match is 26%. This particular community, I'm required to bring come in with a 20% match. So I'm slightly over my 20% match. That's great. That's, that's just perfect. So this is a, a, a good little budget example. Now, when it comes to creating your agency budget, um, we need a sufficient budget to tell the good financial story here. Don't be too brief, but don't be too detailed. When we say don't be too brief, every year I get a, a one or two applications where it says the line items are construction, $850,000, match, $400,000. Okay, that doesn't tell us a thing. That doesn't tell us what we're buying or whatever. On the flip side, we sometimes get budgets that go all the way down to the bolts and the nails, and we don't need that much detail. We, do, we don't want to hold you accountable for seven pounds of nails and bolts. So you want to tell, just you know, kind of hit that happy medium. The types of line items that we'd prefer to see are listed right here in the middle of the page, you know, design and engineering, earthwork, construction, restroom building, play equipment, fall surfacing, plumbing, electrical, et cetera, et cetera. So you want to tell enough, put enough in your budget to tell us a good generalized story of what we're going to build or what we're going to buy. Don't be too brief. Don't be too detailed. 
And lastly, please do not include a line item for contingency. Now I understand this is totally normal in the bidding world and everything, but when it comes to a local government grant program budget, we wanna see every dollar have a home. So you can have contingency dollars. You can spread an extra $20,000 throughout your entire budget, but just spread it out through all the line items so that every dollar has a purpose and it's not just dangling out there in an, in an ambiguous contingency. Once you've submitted your application that goes through our internal technical review, <clears throat> we check to make sure the application is complete, that the budget, budget is reasonable, like we just talked about, that there's an appropriate scope of work. We make sure all the attachments are included. And we also take into consider past grant performance and compliance. There is a question, the last question in the application says, you know, how have you been doing in previous grant awards? You can look back and see your entire history with us, all of your past uh, grant projects and, and everything. So um, that information is available to you. What we ask is you just kind of give us a quick summary at the end of, you know, how your past grant projects have transpired and how they completed. Once the application, once we feel it's all dialed in and ready to go, then we uh, tag your application as ready to go to the advisory committee. The advisory committee is an 11 member group and they're composed of representatives typically from parks and park rec recreation departments, uh, west of the Cascades, east of the Cascades, uh, small community, large community, people with disabilities, parks and rec district, uh, one representative from OPRD, one representative from the Oregon Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee, and then three public at large. Great, great bunch of people. These people bring so much interesting wealth of knowledge to the table. They're really a great group to work with. Committee, the committee advisory committee typically meets in June or early July to hear project presentations of the large grant category. This is any uh, request that's larger than 100,000. They do need to make a presentation to the advisory committee. The committee will score each project and then all those scores are totaled and averaged to establish a project ranking list. And then that ranking list is forwarded to the OPRD commission for final review and approval. So the committee doesn't slice and dice anybody's application. They don't say you can do this, but you can't do this. They look at everything in its entirety. They rank the project. They don't really say yes or no to any projects. They just rank them. And then we basically fund them until we run out of money. That's how that works. Applicants applying for a grant greater than 100,000 must make a presentation to the committee. You'll Presenters will have 20 minutes to make their presentation and answer any questions. We recommend allowing seven to 10 minutes for questions. The uh, advisory committee will already be familiar with your application. And this is your opportunity to basically highlight, you know, what it will cost, what it will do, and who is gonna benefit in your community and why it's important. PowerPoint is the most common type of presentation. It's not required, but that's pretty much what everybody does. If you do choose to use a PowerPoint, that needs to be submitted to me in a PDF format one week prior to the presentation meeting. This is what the advisory committee meetings used to look like. And then the pandemic hit and we discovered the wonders of Zoom. And this is pretty much the way the meetings look now. And then of course we forward your application once it's been approved, we forward that off to the OPRD commission for their final approval. And this is, this is what the commission looks like. For our smaller um, category grants, there is no presentation required for the small grant category requests of 100,000 or less, and for the planning grant category. These applications are all reviewed by an in-house OPRD committee. Just to kind of touch on the entire timeline, we try to open the local government grant program cycle, <clears throat> excuse me, January 1st of every year. And here we are today with our February webinar. Applications are due on April 1st of every year for the large grant category, and then May 1st for the small grant category and May 15th for the planning grant applications. Now you might open an application and say, look, they all say April 1st. Well, that's true. We can only put one date in the system at a time. So once we pass that April 1st date, we'll quickly go in and change the due date to from April 1st to May 1st for this, from going from the large to the small, because the applications are actually the same. And then again, we have our local government grant program advisory committee meeting uh, in uh, June, sometimes possibly July. 
And then July, possibly August, we'll have our small grant planning grant uh, application scoring and reviewing process. In September, all the applications go before the OPRD commission for their approval. And then typically in October, November is when we can send out agreements for grantees to review. They send it back to us and then we send back a fully signed agreement along with a notice to proceed letter and then project work can begin. Now it is very important that project work not start before you receive a completed, or a completed uh, agreement and a notice to proceed letter from us. If you do, unfortunately, anything that falls outside of those date parameters, we might not be able to reimburse you. On. So uh, that's something to be very mindful of. If you are indeed awarded a project, uh, an application agreement, um, responsibilities of the grantee, you will need to submit quarterly progress reports. You do this online just as if you are doing an application. However, the progress reports are just a very simple one page, very quick, easy to do progress reports. It's just a great little check-in tool, helps us know that um, um, things are humming right along. Uh, you will need to keep accurate record keeping. You'll want to track all your project expenses. You know, we assume you know this, but you'll want to assign like a project code so that all these uh, expenses can be pulled out of your accounting system for easy access. You want to track any staff time that's used as match, any volunteer time as well, or any donated materials and donated equipment. You want to document that as well. When it comes time to submitting a request for reimbursement, you want to include copies of all your project bills and invoices. And you also need to submit confirmation that those bills or invoices have indeed been paid. <clears throat> All of the re, um, reimbursement requests submitted to us basically need to be able to pass a state audit. So when you're putting this stuff together, you know, think like an auditor and you'll do fine. In most cases, uh, every project has about two years to complete from beginning to end. Extensions and amendments are possible on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, of course, all projects have to meet ADA requirements. And then last, I just, uh, an admonition here for you, plan for staff transitions. In every given year, we are faced with situations where one particular person champions a project from all through the application process and getting it rolling and they get it halfway through and then they retire or they decide to take another job, they move on, whatever. And all this, uh, this grant knowledge is not adequately passed on to someone behind them to kind of pick up the ball and, and run with them. And then so then six months later, we get a reimbursement request that's just a bunch of bills. And they say, yeah, we'd like to get paid for this. And yeah, that's not the way it works. And they weren't adequately prepared. So if you're if you see any kind of move in your future, please pass on uh, you know all this information to the person that's backfilling your position, so that uh, there's continuity in the project and things don't fall through the cracks. We do ask that you post a sign on the completed project. You can post a sign of your own making, like the one here on the left, or we can provide one for you, like the one on the right. Just a couple of things to keep in mind here. Any park and recreation areas and facilities developed with local government grant assistance must be dedicated for park and recreation purposes for a minimum of 25 years. In other words, any time that we put money into a park or an area or facility has to stay intact and then open for recreational use for 25 years. Anything that is acquired with local government grant program money, so actually you know, property purchased, that park property has to stay in recreational use for perpetuity. We will provide you with a notice of grant to be recorded at the county. So that's an attachment to the deed so that if anyone searches the deed, they'll say, oh yeah, this, is, this property has gotta be dedicated for outdoor recreational use. When you hear the term conversion, that's basically converting property out that was once in recreational use out of recreational use. So and when that happens, then we have to go through what's called a conversion process where you have to find replacement property of equal or greater recreational utility and value. So you wanna keep that in mind uh, as you move forward. At that point, have we had any questions that... Um, Lots of great questions. Yeah, thanks everybody for submitting your questions. Um, one just easy one right up front is if you could pull up the funding slide again, just to show what funds are available. 
Um, and then if you could specifically, if it's not covered on the slide, talk about what we had for large grants last year versus this year. And I know it was probably hard for everybody to be on mute and you not hear them laugh at your little Supreme Court. <laughs> well, here's one of them. Is this where we okay. need to start? Yeah, yep. So this just shows the difference between what we'll have available overall this year versus last year. And then Mark, what of the 14 versus the 34 will be available just for large grants, if that makes sense? Um, 28 million this year. Okay. And how much was available for large grants last year? That's part of the question too. Five. Great. In, in round numbers. Thank you. Oh, no, excuse me. I take that back. Um, 12, I, I believe it was 14 was available. We ended up awarding 12. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and then can you talk a little bit more just about the limit on having two active local government grant projects at once um, and any kind of case by case flexibility we might have this year? Oh, good question. Mm -hmm. uh, the way the manual reads is you can have two up to two local government grant program um, app, uh, projects active at any given time. So if you have two active, you can submit another application if one of those active applications is about to close. So I kind of think the rule of thumb, we would say if it was going to close by around this coming June, you could go ahead and submit an application. If you were, if you had two active right now, one of them is going to wind down and complete, you know, in the neighborhood of June, you could go ahead and submit another application for another project. Great, thank you. And then that the two grant limit that applies across the board to all three categories as far as large, small, and planning. Correct. Is that correct? Okay, that is correct. Yes. Um, there were some more nuanced project questions, and I would just encourage folks to call or email Mark. That's what we're here for um, this time of year with our grant cycles. Mm -hmm. um, so some about just eligibility of specific projects or parklands. Um, definitely don't hesitate to get in touch with Mark after this. Yeah, we'd be um, happy to field any particular questions. We realize some of your situations get, you know, very nuanced and specific, and we'll be happy to talk to you about that. Yeah. And there was some some SCORP questions. Those I would encourage you to, to get in touch with Mark if you have particular questions, too, about the SCORP um, and how those relate to your application, if you don't find that in the mm -hmm. manual. Um, I have uh, something to yeah. add, because I've gotten this question already more than once. So I'm just going to go ahead and say... You should, if you have an OPRD grants that org account, which you will need to have to apply. If you don't have one yet, you should get one. Um, a lot, I'm getting a lot of questions about past projects. If you have that account and you're associated with your organization, it doesn't matter if you've had turnover in your um, agency. Um, all your past projects should be under the project panel. So there's an applications panel. You can see what applications you have in or have done in the past. And then you will be able to see your past funded projects. And those are, we do want you to address those um, in your past performance. Um, you don't need to list them all out, but you should look at those past projects and, and just make sure that everything is, is okay with those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one other thing too, if um, so nonprofits are not eligible for the local government, just um, schools as well. Um, and as far as I know that there could be some partnerships where maybe your nonprofit is working with the city or county, the nonprofit can't apply on their own, or we wouldn't set up a nonprofit to have access to the local government grant program on our website. But that city or county or park district, et cetera, they could tell us, please give this volunteer or this partner permission to access our city organization so mm -hmm. that that nonprofit staffer or volunteer can help the city or county um, fill out their application. But just know for the city and county folks and the other governments um, that those volunteers or nonprofits will have access to all of your past grant history, like Michelle was talking about. Um, mm -hmm. So we can't limit them just to one application at a time. They It's sort of all or nothing as far as giving them access. Uh, but we do have two programs open to nonprofits, and those are trail specific, the recreational trails program and um, ATV grant program. Um, and then All as correct. far as the um, webinar recording and slides, I know we we have dropped a link to where those will be posted on our website. But Mark, will you be emailing everyone who registered for this, just letting them know once those are up? I could do that. Cool. Great. Thank you.
Um, some more questions about the grant account. So when you go into our system to uh, request a grants account, so you go to oprdgrants.org, mm -hmm. you put in your information, name, phone number, address, and then you select an organization. So city of um, whatever your county, park district, port district might be, because um, the, the accounts are by user, but then we attach those to the eligible organization. So individuals should all have their own account. I know some of you have addresses like city manager at such and such city. And yes, we understand those will work differently. Um, but if you have an individual staff email, just request your own account so we know kind of who's doing what in the system and can follow up accordingly. But under yeah. the same mm -hmm. organization, though. We yes. don't, if you already yep. have an organization, mm -hmm. please don't request mm -hmm. to add another organization. Mm -hmm. um, it, it should, we do have we do have most um, eligible organizations already in our system for the local government grant program. Mm -hmm. So if you don't find it, you might uh, send Mark a note or um, you, you can ask for the organization, but it's likely in there. Yeah, yeah. So just use the drop down. We do get some where people will type in the name of their city. And when that happens, I just connect them to the city that's already existing in there. So just use the drop down um, and if not, get a hold of one of us. Um, a question just popped in about uh, construction plan development. So maybe your planning engineering costs. Um, so those can be included in your budget, but it has a percentage cap of how much planning type engineering costs can be included. Mark, do you want to talk a little bit? Limited to 15% of the total project cost. Great. So, so if you, again, if you've got a $100,000 project, you can have up to 15,000 in design and engineering costs. Thank you. And then another one about how important it is to have working construction drawings as opposed to concept plans. Um, my overly simplistic answer would be it depends. Um, these need to be shovel ready projects that you can get done in two years. Um, so just thinking about what kind of engineering is required for your project, which is gonna vary hugely across different types of projects. Um, and then thinking about when the next stage of your final engineering or permitting might take place and just kind of considering all that within the timeline of is this feasible to get done. If I just have a concept plan, you need to be able to show how you're gonna finish that final engineering or planning. Um, I know some folks do design build contracts, so there's a lot of nuance um, once we get in there, but we don't have like a hard limit of you must be at 60% engineering, no. et cetera. No. no, we certainly entertain applications that have just a concept and that's that's totally reasonable. Mm -hmm. We understand you know, we're gonna get a variety of applications, some with just concept plans and some are actually gonna be uh, come in with ready to go engineering plans, but we realize not everybody can do that. So that's that's not a and that's not a detriment to uh, an applicant if they don't have engineer plans, not at all. The majority of the plans will come in with just a concept plan. And once they know that they've got a project moving forward, then they'll jump into the engineering side of it. Great, thank you. And that's um, primarily why we limit it to 15% because you're pretty much should be pretty much done a bit pretty close to having those uh, ready to execute. Mm -hmm. Um, and somebody else asked, are all departments in a city considered when limiting active grants to two? Could separate departments apply independently? No, it's all it's all tied to the city itself. The city is one entity. Right. Okay, somebody is asking, you mentioned community cohesion is a valid answer for how the project includes sustainability. Can you elaborate on that? Is this like this, do you have a social sustainability? Is that where it falls in or? You know, that's all gonna be kind of uh, community specific. Um, you know, if, if, if it's, I'm just, just kind of tossing out a potential um, scenario where maybe, you know, uh, I can think of one community south of us in the southern part of the state where they developed a park that's right downtown. And then, uh, you know, it's a great gathering place. It's just for community cohesion, that sort of thing. They have an annual festival. That, I mean, it's a great park facility, but it, it, they really have a thematic community event that happens there every year as well. So it kind of serves dual purposes. Yes, thank you, Mark. And there's another question just about um, universal design going beyond the ADA. 
Um, one thing I will um, just mention is that OPRD recently released some accessibility design standards that came about through a um, bill that passed a few years back. And those standards, I mean, there it covers the basic ADA, ABA, which is the Architectural Barriers Act, but then it also talks about universal design. So things that go beyond just the minimum standards. And I don't know, Mark or Michelle, if you want to give some more examples. Well, you think of, you know, accessibility, we think of literally physical barriers, but, you know, in recent years, so much more attention has been given um, to <clears throat> different sensory type uh, needs of children, autistic needs, uh, you know, there's there's a whole lot of research going on now, and, and a lot of this trickles into the playground equipment industry, and so there's just, there's just a lot that can uh, get incorporated into a, a, a park or a play area now that wasn't available years ago. Mm -hmm. One of the and another, oh, go, go ahead, ahead Joey. Or I was just gonna say um, another example we see is um, on mountain bike trails where there's no technical standards for accessible mountain bike trails, um, adaptive mountain bike trails, we've been seeing more of those. And there's some standards and guidance out there. They're not included in the ADA, but they can help you know increase access to those type of trails. Now, go ahead, Michelle. So what you want to think about is, um, you know, I guess um, how you can have maybe like a seamless, if you're doing a, a playground where people of different abilities or needs can play in the same space. So um, where you're not like putting off to the side a special accessible area where all children can use, could utilize that playground equipment. So that's just one part of the the concept but it is you know what you do consider are you know cognitive vision you know hearing social there's all kinds of disabilities but it's it's really about um kind of it's not so much about ada obviously that's required by law so it's more about um thinking creatively in design and and like they were both saying before there is a lot of there are a lot of other there are a lot of options out there um, right now for universal design. Yeah, and um, there was a follow-up question too about that just for trails or walkways. Um, and I will point you back to that link um, that does talk about boardwalks because um, there are some you know standards that apply to boardwalks and then there's more best practices and um, you can, there is a trail section in that link you can look to or you're um, more than welcome to follow up with us. And there's no other questions in the list. Oh, Moby Mats. Um, have we been funding the Moby Mats through our programs at all? Those are the, the not, beach mats that you beach, can. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. We have not seen any uh, requests for anything like that yet. And that's really something I've only been coming aware of just recently. Yeah, it's something that you could maybe, um, you know, we'd want to know how it would be applied and how often it would be used and and all of that, but it, it's potentially, yeah, it potentially could be something that's funded. Um, again, it's it's gonna be, you know, kind of specific to your project. Yeah. I do know that tourism funding um, has really um, helped a lot of those projects with Moby Mats um, and some of those accessible beach wheelchairs. So um, it's eligible, it sounds like for local government, but I'd also encourage folks to um, look at some tourism funding, especially if it's just, that's all you need or it's a smaller mm -hmm. um, ask like that. And nothing else. I think Mark will be busy answering all your calls and emails. Um, but again, that's that's what we do. I'm sorry, sorry. You, you can yeah. yeah close it out, Mark. Very good. Thank you both uh, for fielding those questions. Mm -hmm. And thanks, everyone, for asking uh, really good questions. And if you have other questions that you um, didn't get answered here, feel free to shoot me an email. Give me a phone call. That's what we're here for. We're here to kind of field the questions and help you through the process. So thank you very much for spending your time with us today. And we'll be looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks.